Hi, it's Katrina. Number 10, the Aztec underworld. In Aztec mythology, those who died had to go through an intense journey down into the underworld. The underworld, known as Mictlan, had nine levels, similar to the nine circles of hell. But in Aztec mythology, everyone, both good and bad, had to take this journey. It lasted four years and was filled with dangerous obstacles. The objective was to eventually arrive at the heart of the underworld, where the soul of the departed could finally rest for eternity. Just like practically every culture, we definitely don't have any physical evidence that an Aztec underworld ever existed. But archaeologists have found plenty of examples in architecture and artwork throughout Mexico of the journey itself, in the spooky caves and tunnels underneath Aztec cities. The first step was to cross a river with the help of a dog that had a bright color so that it would help you see in the darkness. Even in death, our doggy friends are still helping us out. Most researchers believe the dog was inspired by the Mexican hairless dog that is still alive today. The next level was to travel across some ghostly mountains and follow a dangerous path of obsidian rock, which the Aztecs revered as blades used for human sacrifice. The fourth level was a place where the spirit had to stop and remember the saddest moment of their life. To get rid of the sadness, the spirit had to travel through miles and miles of snow to get to the middle of the journey. This was a place with such strong winds that most souls would get stuck. Those who weren't strong enough were blown away into oblivion. If you did manage to make it through, you would be met by a barrage of arrows raining down. And if you didn't get hit, you could continue on to reach the jaguar. This jaguar god would ask you to abandon any worldly things you might still have. The jaguar deprived the soul of its heart, so the soul had to be completely free of everything in order to travel on. Nearing the end, in the eighth stage, the soul would watch their entire life over again, and then finally they would meet Mictlan Tecutli, the god of the dead depicted as a blood-spattered skeleton with a headdress of owl feathers and a necklace of human eyeballs. And here is where the soul could finally rest. Not quite my version of peaceful, but hey. Number nine, trash tombs. Just about 2000 years ago, the Roman city of Pompeii had a trash problem. Even before it was buried by volcanic ash in the eruption of Mount Vesuvius, Pompeii was kind of a mess, particularly the tombs of Pompeii. Archaeologists have discovered trash littering the floors of multiple tombs, so much so that it was obviously a huge problem. The litter includes animal bones, pieces of broken pottery, smashed bricks, and dirty old charcoal. The mystery here is that scientists have been trying to figure out why the ancient Romans were using tombs where their dead were laid to rest as garbage dumps. Now archaeologists have come up with a new theory. To explain why there is so much trash buried with the dead, they say there was an earthquake 15 years before the eruption that decimated Pompeii. The eruption caused chaos and disorder and resulted in a lot of structures being broken. Since there was so much rubble and nowhere to put it, the citizens just started dumping it in the tombs. It's really shocking to see that even 2000 years ago, when push came to shove, tombs also lost their sacred value and were used for more practical purposes. Number 8. The Coyote Man From between 1400 and 1521, the Mesoamerican civilization known as the Tarascan dominated huge parts of western Mexico. During drainage work in the municipality of Tacambaro de Codallos, construction workers came across the statue of the Coyote Man. This just so happened to be the exact same place where in ancient times the Tarascan had built the amazing city of Tsintsunza. In the local language, the city name translates to Place of the Hummingbirds. The sculpture of the Coyote Man is nothing short of fascinating. It depicts a man-slash-coyote hybrid perched on a huge throne of basalt. It's only about three feet tall, but it's unlike anything else that's been excavated in the area. Other figures of a Coyote Man have been found, but they are usually quite small. This one is enormous, but the Coyote Man is a huge mystery. The very last rulers of Tsin Sun San called themselves the lineage of the Eagle. They don't appear to have had much to do with coyotes at all. 
yet there were some other large cities nearby, with one of them being Hiwatsio. This translates roughly to Place of the Coyotes, and it's been where most of the sculptures were discovered. Researchers believe that there may have been a totally separate dynasty or cult ruling the neighboring city, who may have considered themselves to be descendants of the coyote. Number 7. The Lady Scribe The skeleton of a woman from medieval times was discovered buried at a monastery complex in Germany in the city of Dalheim. Anita Radini from the University of York took an interest in the skeleton and did a full investigation. She discovered traces of the blue gemstone lapis lazuli in her teeth. What this means is that the woman most likely worked as an artist, licking her paintbrush or inhaling blue dust. This would happen if you were grinding the very expensive blue stones to create the blue pigment. During medieval times, this monastery, along with many others, was responsible for creating the beautiful illuminated manuscripts that took a high level of knowledge and skill to make. But it's been a long-held assumption that they were always written and painted by monks, who were men, and women were not allowed. So how did a woman end up buried in a monastery with blue on her teeth? While nuns were involved with the church, they weren't usually allowed to do anything important, at least that we know of, because there isn't much documentation. Yet the discovery of blue on this woman's teeth suggests she was actually quite talented. The woman was somewhere between 45 and 60 when she died, with her bones being dated back to the 10th or 11th century. According to an expert on medieval scribes, Allison Beach, the only way someone could have gotten lapis lazuli on their dental tar would be if they were a highly skilled artist. This means that women, religious artists, could have been much more common than we thought. Much of the artwork still in circulation today could very well have been done by female scribes sitting in a monastery somewhere. Except it was then signed by a man to hide the truth. Number 6. Viking Longhouses In Norway, archaeologists used ground-penetrating radar to detect five previously undiscovered longhouses. One of the buildings once stood 197 feet long, making it the largest known Viking longhouse anywhere in Scandinavia. The longhouses were found by the same team that discovered a Viking ship at the archaeological site of Gelestad in 2018. The buildings are all from the Iron Age and are accompanied by several nearby burial mounds. If it hadn't been for the radar scans, the archaeologists would have never identified these amazing structures. Nobody knows what the longhouses were used for, but considering the shocking size of the biggest, this must have been a very important place. And because of its proximity to the huge burial ship found years before, archaeologists may have accidentally stumbled upon a secret Viking capital. This could have been one of the biggest and most important Viking settlements in Scandinavia, and yet nobody knows its name or why it was abandoned. It's a total mystery, one that archaeologists are still working very hard to solve. Number 5. Stonehenge Celebrations the story of Stonehenge is one of the most remarkable and mysterious in all of Europe. It's undoubtedly the most enigmatic historical landmark in the world, built 4,500 years ago. This was a time of huge social change in Europe, as well as the beginning of technological advances that would bring us to where we are today. But nobody knows what Stonehenge was used for. There have been all kinds of theories and suggestions, but we simply don't know exactly. A new study in 2019 revealed that Stonehenge may have been used for mass gatherings. We already knew that it was probably used for strange rituals, but the study has revealed more specific details. Archaeologists examined 131 pig bones discovered at four Neolithic sites around Stonehenge. After extensive research and looking at old animal bones across all of Britain, the experts came to one conclusion. It seems people traveled from all over the UK and brought pigs with them. They then hunkered down near Stonehenge, within a 20-mile radius, at one of the multiple megalithic sites, and butchered their pigs as part of a massive festival. Research has shown the pig bones found near Stonehenge are identical to pig bones that were raised locally in Scotland, West Wales, the northeast of England, and other regions of the British Isles. Dr. Richard Madgwick says this demonstrates a scale of movement and social complexity 
that nobody had previously believed possible. It doesn't solve the mystery once and for all, but it shows that Stonehenge truly was the center of ancient life here. If you could go back in time, would you attend the Great Gathering at Stonehenge? See how the pyramids were built? Or something else? Let me know in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. We've got lots more videos coming up. Number 4. Ancient Super Camel When archaeologists were working to restore a temple in Iraq that had been damaged by ISIS, they found something strange. They uncovered evidence of an ancient hybrid camel. The discovery was made at the Temple of Alat from the 2nd century AD. It was once part of the great city of Hatra, capital of the Hatra Kingdom. Sadly, the remains were vandalized and destroyed between 2015 and 2017, and before that had been greatly neglected. Above a door at the temple was found a horizontal piece of stone artwork. It shows a monstrous ancient camel, but the picture of the camel is just one piece of the puzzle. Archaeologists have found other pieces of artwork to suggest that there was a crossbreed of camel found throughout much of the Middle East over 2,000 years ago. The hybrid camel is something of a mystery because researchers have been trying to figure out when experimentation began with mixed breeding. It seems to have been in the first century, when people took Bactrian camels from Central Asia with two humps and bred them with Arabian camels that only had one hump. The result was a beast of massive proportions. The animal was so impressive that it became sacred. Kings would have monopolies on breeding specific types of camels because they were so valuable. Camels were responsible for bringing merchants back and forth on the Silk Road, which back in the day meant big money. Stronger and more durable camels meant more and more money flowing faster and faster through trade. This made camels some of the most important animals of the ancient world. Horses were for war, but camels were for riches. Number 3. Native American Trade Networks Archaeologists have always wondered just how extensive trade networks were between Native American tribes before Europeans arrived. Now, a research team of professionals from Binghamton University and State University of New York have made some interesting breakthroughs. They discovered a copper band from 3,500 years ago buried with the cremated remains of seven people in Georgia. It was unique because until now, both copper and cremated remains were almost never found in the Southeast United States. At least not from between 3,000 to 8,000 years ago. Copper and cremated remains have, however, been discovered frequently in the Great Lakes region. That's nearly 1,000 miles away. The mystery presented to archaeologists is how a copper band made on almost the other side of the country wound up buried in a grave in coastal Georgia. Also, why were the dead cremated in the Great Lakes fashion instead of in the local fashion of just being buried? The theory is that there was an extensive trade network that went all across North America, connecting tribes and settlements. It was much vaster than experts have ever imagined, trading not only goods like copper, but also cultural practices like the cremation of the dead. Number 2. The Golden Pendant Archaeologists were left holding on to their hats when a golden pendant depicting an Egyptian goddess was found in an unexpected place. The ancient piece of jewelry shows a depiction of the goddess Hathor, crafted in about 1500 BC, but it was uncovered very far from Egypt in a Greek tomb in the ancient city of Pylos. Hathor can easily be identified by her huge crow-like ears. She was the goddess of the sky and of fertility. The pendant was uncovered in one of two underground tombs known as Tholos, which were excavated by archaeologists with the University of Cincinnati. They were looking for the remnants of an abandoned town that once surrounded the great palace of Nestor. They thought they might find workshops and houses, but instead, they found the tombs. And here's where things get mysterious. These tombs were uncovered very close to where a different burial site was found in 2015, known as the Griffin Warrior Grave. In this grave, archaeologists found all kinds of treasure, and even Minoan artwork that must have arrived via a trade network from the island of Crete. With this newest discovery of the Egyptian pendant, Archaeologists are pretty sure the city of Pylos may have played a major role in the Mycenaean civilization. 
The Mycenaeans lasted from between 1650 to 1100 BC, originating from Mycenae in Greece. But with the discovery of so many foreign artifacts, it seems the city may have played a bigger role in sea trade than previously thought. It may even have boasted a surprisingly large population of people from foreign lands. The pendant was brought to the city by a native Egyptian, maybe, someone who may have moved to a new kingdom in search of a better life. Number 1. Tiny War Horses A team of archaeologists working closely with historians have discovered the mysterious truth behind ancient war horses. You know, the powerful stallions that once carried valiant knights into battle. We've all seen movies and TV shows showing knights in suits of armor storming across a battlefield on a great big steed. But after examining the bones of 2,000 horses from between the 4th and 17th centuries, that may be a bit of an exaggeration. Researchers looked at horse bones found in medieval cemeteries and other archaeological sites, including English castles. What they found is that medieval war horses were probably much smaller and daintier than the way we imagine them. They weren't hulks by any means, but more likely about the size of modern ponies. Professor Alan Outram from the University of Exeter says we need to throw away everything popular culture has tried to teach us when it comes to war horses. They were actually very small, so small that the person riding them probably would have been able to almost touch the ground. The horses used in war probably stood no taller than 4 feet 10 inches. Of course, there could have been larger ones, but the researchers never found any. It really makes you wonder just why the soldiers used horses at all if it didn't give them much of a tactical advantage, but they were able to move faster. On such short horses, they would have been easy targets for the other soldiers, so I guess it's a little give and take. Thanks for watching! Let me know your thoughts on these mysterious archaeological discoveries in the comments below, and be sure to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already, and I'll see you soon. Bye!